Welcome back on this second video on LTI Advantage. So now we're going to look at the main changes that was brought by LTI 1.3, which are around security and how trust is established between the learning platform and the learning tool. So first, uh, we'll do a quick recap about where we were before LTI 1.3. So in the prior version of LTI, the trust was established using a symmetric key. So in a simpler way, we can just say a shared secret. So that symmetric key or shared secret, uh, what it means by it being symmetric is that it's the same key that is used to sign a request going out and to verify the signature. And so the process was usually something like that. So a platform would ask us a tool for an identifier and a secret. So the platform was not creating the secret. Yet that secret was what was used to secure access to data living inside the learning platform. So the secret needed to be passed from one party to the other, and that means either email, Slack, whatever you wanted, but it needs to be transferred from one party to the other. And all this adds to the vulnerability of the shared secret uh, in itself. So also the platform did not really control the strengths of the secret. I mean, it could refuse a, a secret coming from a tool, but really the tool uh, was uh, generating the secret. In addition, nothing really prevented the tool to share the same secrets with many platforms. So if one side leaked, the secrets and both sides were compromised. And finally, changing the secret is something that was rarely done because it was actually quite complicated to do so. It required the both party to orchestrate the, the rotation so that there was no LTI request broken in flight. So really, I need to tell you, OK, you're ready to change the secret on my side. You're ready to change the secret on the other side. Let's do it together at the same time. So in practice, it did not happen very often. So all of this is to say that the shared secret uh, was a simple scheme, but it was not a really good foundation for security to moving forward and to build on to extend the LTI ecosystem. So what is better than symmetric then? Well, of course, it's asymmetric. So at the edge of the uh, asymmetric is that you don't use the same key to sign your request and you use a, to verify it. You actually use a key pair. So a key pair is like two sides of the same coin. So a key pair is made of a public side and a private side. So what we call the public key and the private key. So once generated, the private key is safely stored. Ideally, nobody never sees a private key. The system generates it and stores it in a private safe, like for example, HashiCorp Vault. And on the other side, uh, the public key, however, can be posted to everybody. You can put it on Twitter. Everybody can get to know it. So in LTI, we use a key pair to assert who is the sender of the message. So here, we're not talking about encryption in LTI. We're talking purely about signing the message. So the sender, which we call issuer, which is often abbreviated in the payload as ISS, is the one which is going to send the message. And the receiver is called an audience and is often abbreviated into the payload as AUD for audience. And so, the, uh, so when a message is sent, the sender will use his trust store to sign the message using its private key. Then the message will be transferred on the other side and the receiver will check what the recorded public key is for this issuer and verify with the public key that this message was properly signed by that issuer. And so it can be trusted. So in LTI, each side has both a public key and a private key, its own private key and the public key from the other party. So now all that is fine, but we still have not addressed the key rotation. I mean, how do you... How does one side decide to say, OK, I need to change my private key and therefore reissue a new public key? With LTI, we uh, use uh, mechanics of indirection. So rather than passing the public key to the integration partners, a platform or a tool can instead pass a URL to get the public key. This is known as the JW key set URL or JSON web key set URL. And so this set contains at least one public key, and it may contain more. So alongside the key set uh, URL, it becomes necessary to say which key is used when you sign a message. So basically, you sign a message and you say this message was signed with this key, which is identified by a key ID, which is referred as key ID. Now, when the recipient receives a message with an unknown key ID, it indicates that the cache version of the key set is outdated and it needs to be refreshed. So now it can go query the, the issuer for a refreshed key set and then look, look up the um, new public key in that key set. So this allows to do rotation at any time. So we haven't talked about the message itself. We know it must contain the issuers, the audience, the key ID, but also which algorithm was used to do the signature. 
Well, so it contains some expiry time and a timestamp, things like that. So all of that actually have been defined already uh, through a specification called JSON Web Tokens, and more precisely, JSON Web Signature, which is a way to encode all those information into a JSON payload. See, a JSON Web Signature token is actually made of three parts, uh, which are the actual payload, so the information is being exchanged from one, part to the, from one side to the other, and those are actually called claims, and so the payload is actually called a claim set. Then there is a header, and the header, for example, is going to tell you which algorithm was used to build that token. And finally, in our case, because it's a JSON web signature, then you have the actual signature of the uh, token itself. And all of that is base 64 encoded. So rather than talking about it, let's have actually a look at an actual uh, LTI uh, JSON web token and see what's inside it. And so for that, we'll use actually a website called JWT.io. And I'm going to use the LTI token I got from uh, one of the learning platform and we'll look at what's inside it. So here we are in JWT.io. So that's a very useful website because it allows you to take a token that, for example, you get from the uh, a network tab in your browser and paste it in there and see what's inside it. So that's exactly what I did here. I, I took a token from a Moodle LTI launch and we are going to look at side what's it's inside that token. So I'm just going to paste the token into the encoded section. And so we see here the actual token, just going to show you the three parts of it. So the, they are dot separated. So the first part is the actual header, then the actual payload, which is a lot of information in LTI. So it's a rather big claim set. And finally, the signature in blue here. So let's have a look on the uh, actual decoded uh, version of that. So again, everything is base 64 encoded. So it's the right side base 64 decoded for it for you. So we can have a look here. So the first thing is that you have the header. So it really tells you what it is. So it tells you, well, that's a jot. And it tells you which algorithm was used here. It says it's an RSA signature. And very importantly, it says which key was used to do the signature for the key ID. And uh, then we look at the actual uh, payload, uh, so claim set. So the first few claims are around the JSON, uh, JWS, uh, the JSON Web Signature uh, claims. So we'll find here who issued the, uh, the token, for which it's in, it is intended. And as a recipient, you must make sure that it's actually intended for you. The issuer will let you find the public key set. Inside the public key set, you should find the key ID, which will let you then use you know which key to use to verify the actual token. And then it has an expiry and issued at, and all of those are part of the JWS uh, specification. Then we'll find information about the user, and you see sub here, which is actually the user ID, subject, user ID. And somewhere around here, you'll find also the given name, family name, name, so all of those information and email here. So all of those information you see are very small claims because they're actually coming from the OpenID specification. So this token is actually not only a JWS token, but it's also an ID token coming from the OpenID specification. And that's how identity is transferred. It's taking the claims from OpenID around identity of the user. But then you have uh, claims that are specific to LTI. And those are the longer claim set here, you'll find. So they all start with uh, this piece of data. And this claim set, will, for example, this one will tell you what is the role of this user. And this basically is telling you this user is an instructor. It will tell you which context it is. And this is basically telling you this is coming from a context ID 2, which is the name of this course here. It's a course section. And other kind of information. So it will also tell you which uh, link was clicked. And here that's a test link. So that's the name of the link that was actually launched. So that's the information that you'll find. So in the claim set, you'll find the JWS related to signature. You'll find the ID token claims uh, around the identity of the user and then the LTI claims. And finally, uh, the signature.